Hey, well, good morning, um, everyone. I think you probably, many of you probably know who I am, Isabel Parkins. I've been involved in real estate for quite a while and have been an instructor for a while. And it's a privilege to be able to come and talk to you today about what's going on in real estate. I titled it Lawsuit Review and what it means for your business. Um, but it's really kind of trying to answer or go over all the different changes that we're seeing or questions that are coming up in the uh, in the business. Before we get started, a few practical things. So um, I we are um, representing many different um, companies. So I want to make sure that we're all on the same page about what is acceptable and not. I will read to you the antitrust statement and make some additional comments. Real estate agents and brokers should not discuss fees or commission with other brokers as it is a violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act, which prohibits price fixing, group boycotting, and other antitrust violations. We are representing here in this group, there, is, there are many of you um, who have joined this group. We are all representing different companies with different business models. And that's what makes real estate kind of interesting. And this is also how we maintain our competitive, the, the competitive nature of the business. We are a very particular business where we all work together as competitors. We cannot in any way, shape or form come across as setting any type of fees. It is called price fixing or boycotting. And we'll discuss that uh, further as we go through the material. So they should, they will be, and they should be no mention of any type of specific compensation that any company decides to set as a company. So uh, no numbers will be addressed. Okay. And compensations are always anything, anything of value that is acceptable to uh, both parties. Okay. Uh, we have in, in, in order to um, avoid, you know, minimize the risk to all of you. We have disabled the chat, so we are not allowing you to have conversation with each other for that specific purpose. Again, you are all representing different companies with different business models. We are not going to discuss how we all run our businesses, okay? Um, so the chat is disabled, but uh, what you do have is the Q and A, uh, the the Q and A, and please use the Q and A for just your questions. I appreciate all the good mornings uh, there. Okay, but in order for me to sort of keep track of the questions as we go through the material, it would make it easier if you could uh, keep the Q and A for specific questions that you have. All right. So that should set up the, the premise and the parameter of what we are discussing, which is going to be a, a quick reminder of the antitrust rules, which we started on this, uh, and the various uh, lawsuits, just a quick summary of what's going on, what then, then sort of bring it back to what does it mean for the real estate business, and what can we do and what should we do to be prepared for whatever the ultimate outcome will be, because one of the things that I will say through this is none of us have a crystal ball and know exactly how this is going to play out in the long term. We're in the middle of a journey and the journey is far from uh, being uh, over. Okay, And um, just, you know, just to keep things in perspective, you know, some of you might have been in the business long enough to remember sub agency. When we changed from sub agency to buyer's agency, it felt like everything was going to fall apart, but you know, we survived. Remember the MLS books? Yes, I am dating myself. Okay. Um, but you know, when, when all this information went first digital and then went online, we're all like panic. I had a moment of panic and says, well, wait a second. If we're giving our information to the consumer, what's going to happen to us? Well, we're still here. Okay. And then I don't know, I put that for fun out there, but you know, Zillow introduced his estimates and we're like, whoa, whoa, wait a second, what are we gonna do? Okay. And again, we we adapted and and we changed slightly um how we we go and how we present things or how we look at things. So the, the the real question today is what is the next paradigm shift? Like like I said, we don't have a crystal ball, we can't exactly know 
um, how things will change. Although I will propose that some of the things are, um, you know, some of the things we can expect more certainly more more than uh, than others. Okay. So we already went over some of the antitrust the antitrust statement. Again, I will re-emphasize this: the real estate business is quite particular as an industry because we all collaborate, but we cannot fix prices. So they cannot be set prices between competitors. If we all charge the same thing, that looks like price fixing, okay? If we all offer the same type of cooperation amount, it starts looking like price fixing and we may run into problems, okay? We cannot boycott. There are all kinds of different business models that are available out there. We can't refuse to work with some real estate companies because we don't like their business model. Um, allocating markets is illegal. Tying agreements, which is requiring uh, requiring one type of transaction in order to uh, to go into another one, is illegal. So those are those are your key antitrust uh, parameters. Okay. The fact that real estate has been the real estate industry has been questioned on their practices in conjunction with the antitrust uh, rules is not new. Okay, this has been going on forever. The Department of Justice and the FTC are sort of the uh, re regulatory agencies at the federal level, and between lawsuits and actions by the the DOJ. Um, there, you know, if you look at it over over time, this is not the first time that we're coming onto in under scrutiny for our business practices. Okay, if you go on this timeline, you'll see that it already starting in the in in 1950, the, the National Association of Real Estate Board, which is what NAR was called at the time. Okay, um, the the uh, the um, the, Fed, the, the rule said that we are subject to the antitrust law. We are not exempt from the antitrust laws for one reason or another, okay? The first lawsuit started to appear in the late 70s. Uh, there is a conspiracy to uh, fix commission. Uh, we were then investigated by the DOJ for boycotting discount brokerages when, uh, when some of those uh, came on the business. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna, uh, sorry, I'm just realizing something. Can you, I hope everybody noted on my first slide that there cannot and there will not be any discussion on a specific compensation number, okay? Compensations are X and Ys, whatever the parties are establishing. So sorry, I'm just seeing stuff. Just please remember that, okay? There is no discussion on uh, specific types of compensation, okay? So back to my, uh, the, the, the 80s, we were investigating for potential uh, boycotting on discount brokerages. They investigated the policies on the virtual uh, offices. I don't know anybody, and that was, you know, we, we lived that specifically in New Jersey when the Real Estate Commission, when we had to amend our licensing regulations to allow for buyer rebates. And that was, that came as a result of a antitrust, um, antitrust uh, uh, threat. Um, we were basically preventing some business models to come to the state by, by, having laws that did not allow those buyers rebates. So we changed our regulation. And then um, um, we have in 2020, there's a DO, the, the NAR and DOJ settlement, which I'll detail in a little bit. And then before that in 2019 was the beginning of the filing of the lawsuits that are sort of the, the big conversation of uh, today with a more one of them having had a more uh, recent uh, verdict, okay. So on my timeline, sorry, this is not what's supposed to happen. Um, on the timeline, um, hopefully the, the slides are still on, okay? On the timeline, I mentioned that there had been a settlement between the DOJ and NAR. And um, that settlement, it's a little bit complicated and we don't, we don't need to sort of understand exactly what's going on as part of that. You know, there's a settlement that was repealed, it's appealed, but that's kind of besides the point because we have made some changes and clarifications. I shouldn't call them changes, I should call them clarifications to our, um, to our policies, okay? What are some of the clarifications on our policies? The offer of compensation that is made 
uh, to a buyer's broker can uh, be made public on a broker's website. We also amended standard of practice 12-1 to say that as a buyer's agent, I will never represent that my services are free or available at no cost. None of us work for free, okay? None of us are a charity organization. We run a business. We expect to be compensated, okay? And we can't mislead consumers in thinking that they our services don't cost anything. So we amended standard of practice 12-1 to make that clear. Okay, we will not say as buyer's agent that we work for free or we our services are available at no cost. Um, as far as the use of lock boxes, you don't have to be a realtor, realtor and non-realtor alike should be should have the ability to use lock boxes to enter properties. Okay. Um, MLSs will not allow sorting of properties based on the cooperation amount. And uh, NAR made it very clear that while they're asking that we disclose what type of cooperation amount is being offered, zero is an amount, okay? Uh, that is totally acceptable and possible. Anything of value when that is something of anything, anything can be put in that offer of cooperation from zero to whatever it is that you are offering, okay? So we've already done some of those uh, changes and, you know, hopefully they work well for everyone. Okay. Now, as far as the lawsuits are, uh, as far as a lawsuit is uh, concerned, okay, the, um, the first one that was filed in um, 2019, okay, uh, that was the Merle one. It was filed in Illinois, okay, and it's against NAR and four large uh, brokerages. The trial is not scheduled to start until uh, next year. Remax and anywhere. So the the four large brokerages, which come back on a regular basis, was uh, Remax anywhere, which is the old Real Realogy. Uh, K KW and Home Services, okay, Remax and anywhere sell or propose a settlement, which still needs to be approved. And then the trial is only scheduled next year. Okay. The one that everybody is talking about right now is the Sitzer Bernard case that was in Missouri. There are six plaintiffs. Again, it was filed in originally in 2019. Uh, by the time, you know, it took a while to make it to trial, but the trial did take place. It was a jury trial, and the jury did find uh, NAR and the defendants and the defendants guilty, which are again those same the same large brokerage firm. The potential damage the, the damage is one point seven eight billion dollars. The, there's a lot of money in the real estate uh, business, okay, but the final sentencing is still pending, so we have no idea. Uh, that was a recommendation from the jury. What we don't know is what the judge will finally um, issue as uh, an, an official sentence. And um, NAR and the uh, remaining brokerages, because again, remember, Remax and Anywhere uh, proposed the settlement, but with the remaining brokerage and NAR, they have, um, they have um, all come forward and said, we will appeal. Uh, and there are many different reasons, and you are making it very clear that there are many different legal aspects of the case that uh, give them ground for appeal. Okay, so this is not the end of the road. This is, as I said, we're in the middle of a journey. That journey started in 2019 when we're talking about those particular cases, and is far from over because the the, the this will probably continue. Um, there is, we, we need the sentencing, there is potential appeals at the state level, federal level, and who knows all the way to the Supreme Court, I have no idea. And this is part of the stuff that, you know, we don't know in the long run how this all is going to play out. But this is what we have uh, right now. The plaintiffs, if you, I, I, I actually read the deposition of uh, the, 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 what the plaintiffs all presented in their, in court. And the overall, uh, you know, sentiment from the plaintiff in that in the plaintiffs in the in that case, they were sellers, and they're like, well, we had no idea that we could negotiate um, the compensation that we had to pay our real estate company. We felt that it was mandatory. 
um, we had, and um, you know, we didn't realize that some of it was going to go pay the buyer's broker. We have nothing against real estate agents. We think that they're very useful, but we really don't understand why we should pay the other side who's not representing us, who's actually in fact uh, working against us. So we don't understand that, okay? And we don't agree uh, agree with that. That's kind of the what transpired from their deposition. And then in Massachusetts, there is the uh, no select versus MLS pin in the same in the same brokerages. There is a settlement that is being proposed. Uh, MLS pin settled, or is trying to settle um, that case. Um, it is um, it is uh, pending final. It is sort of on hold. The DOJ requested that the state waits for final approval of the, approval of the settlement. So that should, that is on hold. But what is at question in this particular case also is the mandatory offer of compensation, okay, and the lack of uh, understanding from the seller as to where the where the money goes. Part of the sell, the uh, the settlement there's a monetary aspect, and um, the proposed settlement basically adds an additional disclosure when you take a listing so that the seller clearly understands, you know, I pay this much and then some of it goes to my broker and some may or may not go to the other uh, broker, okay? Again, we are talking, uh, we're talking about different, you know, com every company is free to establish their own company policy, okay? What we cannot do is have an industry-wide rule because that would be considered price fixing, okay? Um, and, and now what's making the, the news all the time is the fact that we've had a whole slew of new um, lawsuits that have been filed since the Sitzer uh, uh, verdict. Um, they're, we call, they're all copycat lawsuits with some variety, you know, with some variety, a, a little bit of changes as to who we're going after, where they're being filed. Okay, uh, we the Gibson, same attorneys um, as Sitzer, but we're going after a whole bunch of other companies. Uh, you have uh, uh, lawsuits that are filed by buyers. You have lawsuits that are going after Rebney, uh, which is the real estate board in New York. You have in Texas, you have some lawsuits that are now going after the local real, uh, uh, realtor association teams and specific and, and a whole bunch of local uh, companies. Um, those are all part, those are all very similar in, um, in objective is that we are, you know, what's that, what's at stake and what, what's the whole big issue? It's the unilateral offer of compensation. It's the idea that you know, overall real estate commissions are inflated. The latest, you know, yesterday morning, my son sent me a headline in the Wall Street Journal. Okay, only Americans are paying six percent, six percent in commission. I'm re, I'm, I'm stating the headline. Okay, um, but and so we have inflated real estate commissions. Transactions cost too much to the consumer. We are selling to compensation. So it all comes down to this offer of compensation that a seller may extend to a buyer's broker or that a listing broker, sorry, extends to a buyer, a buyer's broker. That's the whole, you know, the fundamental in, uh, issue that is behind all those different uh, lawsuits, okay? The um, and you know, so I say now what? What's going to happen? Again, we're in the middle of a journey. None of us have a crystal ball. How it is ultimately going to play out? One, it is going to depend on the ultimate results of lawsuits, and that can take that may take still a little time before or a long time before we have a a final final result on all that. But you also have to remember that. Besides the legal aspect and the lawsuit, there's the Department of Justice that may impose regulatory changes. And then there are state licensing regulations who may tweak some of our uh, licensing regula laws or licensing regulations. But we could go from one end business as usual. And if you talk to the people in the Northwest, they say, well, we've changed our rules in the MLS a long time ago. Okay, um, and it hasn't changed anything. 
to I can go to the other extreme and say, well, you, the whole buyer side of the business will be gone. Uh, you know, do we really want to go back to sub agency? I don't think so. But this is all speculation. And we really need to sort of, uh, you know, stop speculating, stop the hype, stop the, you know, this is a, this is a disaster or, and look at what's the, you know, go back to it and look at what is the issue and how, you know, what do we have to do in our daily activity in order to make sure that we are ready for however this ends up uh, playing out. Okay. Now, I will say it is a help. Okay. Maybe not everybody agrees, but compensation in real estate have definitely made Main Street media. Okay. And this is, this is, I, I just took some headlines. Okay. You, you've seen them all over the place. Okay. They're on TV, they're in newspapers, they're in, they're in, uh, they're on social media, uh, you know, there are conversations everywhere about real estate compensations. So I look at this as an opportunity. This is, you know, people now are less afraid of talking about it. They may have more questions. The downside of this, there's a lot of misinformation. Okay. Well, this is your opportunity to um, clarify this with the consumer to make it, you know, to explain to the consumer, well, this is how I work. Those are the services that I provide. And for the services that I provide, this is what we charge, okay? So can, can a company have policies on compensation? Absolutely, okay? But at the company level, and they cannot be set based on what other companies do, whatever I do as a company at the company level has to be based on the value that I offer on the services that I offer as a company. Okay. And that's probably um, the, the, the second biggest issue that is transpiring through all those conversations. There is a, there is a, a, a lack of understanding or um, maybe we haven't done a good job at explaining to the consumer Yes, there is a fee that we're charging, but for that fee, you are receiving all those services. Okay. So can a company decide that, you know, we are this type of company, those are the services that we offer. Okay. And for the services that we offer for the work that we do, this is what we charge. Yes. But no, no company can ever say, well, you know what, I do the same thing as this other company, so I'm going to charge the same thing as this other company. That does not work, okay? That is that is the beginning of price setting. So individually, at your own level, at a company level, not a problem, but not between companies, which is why we don't want any conversation. You are rep right now on all this because you are representing all kinds of different companies with different business practices and we don't need to know which uh, what everybody how everybody is managing the relationship between their services and their value okay but for you it also means that consumers now have more questions consumers are going to be more curious so you're going to have to be uh, ready to answer their questions and give sort of an educated clear uh, uh, discussion and presentation on why are you paying this, why are you paying that, and we'll we'll come back to those uh, uh, dis those discussions in a little bit. Okay, I forgot to scroll through my uh, Q and A. Okay, um, so you know the and and there's in in plenty of those articles they will they will compare um, how we run business to other countries and the fact that. We are a country that where it costs the consumer the most amount of money to do a real estate transaction, okay? And they do compare a lot to uh, France and Japan, uh, and they compare to Australia. Um, once you, when you read those articles, I would encourage you to be a little bit curious and go dig a little bit into how business gets done in those other countries. I, some of you already know that I'm originally from France. I recently had to deal with a real estate transaction uh, in France, helping my parents. It is not at all the same thing. Okay. It, and um, I don't think that the consumers are benefiting from the way the business is set up over there, especially not if you are a buyer when uh, listing brokers don't necessarily collaborate. Okay. 
So it, it, you have to be really, um, it, it's, it will be helpful for all of us to sort of educate ourselves and, and understand, well, you know, if we are being compared to all those other countries, how does it really work in those other countries? Okay. Um, Australia comes on the list of countries that we're being compared to. And there is, um, you know, I'm not there to promote any type of uh, Netflix reality show, but uh, there is a great one on selling real estate in Sydney. If you want to work, if you want to know how it works in Australia, go watch the Netflix show. It is not at all how we work in the, in the U.S. So the comparisons are not necessarily uh, fair. Okay. Um, so we'll have the discussion on one of the different scenarios that could uh, happen when it comes to compensation. There are a few things that we know, okay, and that are very clear. Bus real estate business has changed over time for a long time, okay? Uh, those of you who are, have been in this business for a while, um, and some of you have probably been in the business for a very long time, you have seen evolutions to the business, okay? Which is, I say, which is what kind of makes it interesting. You know, we move along. Uh, new technology comes along, you take advantage of it, okay? New opportunities come along, we take advantage of it, okay? Um, new business models cre are created because of new technologies or other reasons. And that's what makes the real estate uh, business interesting, attractive, uh, creative. Uh, some people will say we, you know, we are very resilient, so we will always figure out a way to, you know, answer and respond to the various challenges that are being presented to us. And I still look at this as a great opportunity. Okay, properties will continue to be bought and sold. Okay, uh, homeowners and and uh, and we're talking primarily residential real estate because the commercial world does not have all this problem uh, because they work a little bit differently than than the residential world. But your residential consumer is also very uh, very different. So um, you know homeowners. Um, small investors will continue to buy and sell residential properties, and many of them will continue to need uh, an advisor, a, ga a, a, a ga guide, an advocate for that transaction. Okay, um, It's a complex transaction. It's a large transaction. We keep saying that for many people, it is the largest transaction they will ever do in their life. Okay. It is not something that you don't do, you do without some form of guidance and advice and everything else. And I'm not sure that the internet can 100% replace the uh, real estate professional, okay? So this, this, we, uh, this we, we, we already know. The other thing that the lawsuits had made very clear, the consumers want more transparencies on commission. Consumers, want to have a better understanding, well, you know what, the you are taking so much money out of the transaction amount because, you know, if you really look at it, neither the buyer nor the seller would bring a check. It, the transaction pays for the real estate, for the, for the uh, brokerage fees, okay? But consumers want to have a better understanding how this all works, okay? And what I, you know, I'm not going to be popular when I say this, but maybe we haven't done as good a job as we could uh, or as is possible in explaining what happens to those compensation. Okay. The other thing that, that um, transpires through all those different conversation, the buyer side of the business needs to be treated as professionally as the seller side of the business. Okay. You, um, I'm fairly certain that none of you will list a property after a 30 minute, uh, after a 30 second conversation with a seller. None of you will list a property without uh, having an extensive conversation with a seller, having taken a look at the property, having set, a, uh, having set some parameters uh, before you decide, yes, this is something that I want to get involved with or no. And you do get a written agreement because, hey, we have a benefit. New Jersey requires a written agreement. So you are getting a written contract on that seller side. I'm not sure that the buyer side of the business is treated quite as professionally, you know, 
Do, do you take the time to have a buyer's consultation? Do you sit down with the buyer before you decide, you know, this is a relationship that makes sense. So this is not a relationship that I make sense. I'm the right person for the job or I am, I, I am not. Okay. Um, are you ready to purchase? Are you not? Okay. Wh whatever. But do you do the same buyer's consultation as you do the uh, a listing presentation? And then what I will keep repeating multiple times, okay, do you get formally hired with, with a written buyer's uh, agreement? Okay, because the other thing that has, um, that is uh, clear and um, I have, I can't imagine that it, that it won't uh, change somewhat, okay, as a buyer's agent blindly relying on an offer of compensation for my compensation is not good business practice. That may put me in a position of working for nothing, which is not running a pro profitable business. Okay, so this is what this is what I take away from all the conversation is that no matter what happens, no matter what the long how in the long term all this plays out, we have to do a much better job at explaining compensation. And when we work as buyer's agent, we probably need to rethink our um, process and how we approach the buyer side of the the buyer side of the business. Okay. Um, I look at it as again, wh where does that lead us? Okay. Um, a lot of opportunities. Uh, potentially new business models and you know there's all kinds of discussions out there and when you know we already have uh, all kinds of different varieties of uh, real estate brokerages out there with a whole variety of services that they um, that they offer okay and that may that may be that be, may multiply we may see even more of that we may start seeing uh, companies that have an a la carte type of service you know you can hire us to uh, hold an open house for you. You can hire us to show you a property. You can hire us to negotiate a contract. You can hire us for, you know, pick, pick your, uh, pick your service. And there's a fee associated with that service or a general fee for, you know, beginning to end, or um, we'll only put it on the MLS and then you take it from there. There is really, and, and there are already some of those other business models that exist, okay? We just may see more of those, more variety, um, more, uh, more choices to, for, the, uh, for, the, for the consumers. What it means is that I have to be ready to run my business in light of all those different uh, business uh, models, okay? So that's going to affect probably more the buyer side of the business because on the seller side of the business, you guys are all comfortable with negotiating a fee for your services, but that may not be quite as systematic on the buyer side and we will all benefit of treating the buyer side of the business the same way. You want me to represent you as a buyer's agent. Those are the services that I provide. This is, this is everything that I do for you. Here is my value. But if you want to hide, if you want to receive all those services, they come with a fee. There is a fee attached to it. Okay. I don't, I never will get a contractor to come to my house, bring the material, build a deck, okay? And then only after the deck is built, say, okay, now you owe me this, okay? And think of your business the same way. Should I ever get started and be involved in promising a whole bunch of services without having negotiated uh, with that consumer, what is the fee that is associated for the services that I will provide, okay? So those buyer's agreement, I'm, I'm going to sort of like uh, keep saying the same thing. Start, start really dusting off those uh, buyer's agreement, 
really rethink your buyer side of the uh, of the business. Make sure that you are that you can you know um, express what your value is to the buyers so that they see a reason to guarantee you a certain uh, a certain fee. Okay. Um, hold on. I'm, I'm uh, looking at the, uh, glancing through the Q and A's here. Um, there's a lot of discussion on who pay and you know, how this all really goes. Okay. I, I will address that in a little bit. Okay. And, and um, generally speaking, when I am talking about a fee, a compensation or other, okay, it's anything of value that is acceptable to both sides. Do remember, however, that from a licensing perspective, okay, the, contra the contractual relationships and the payments will always go from the, uh, from the client to the broker, okay? As the, if I'm looking at a listing agreement, it's between the seller and the broker. If I'm looking at a buyer agreement, it's between the buyer and the broker. And compensations will always be paid to the, be paid to the broker. Um, percentage flat fee, retainer fee, upfront fee. You know, on the day of the on the day of the closing, anything that you can that is acceptable to both parties the client and the broker are acceptable um acceptable compensation okay um yeah there is the idea you know can can could we run into a business model where and and this is you know we we hear this in all the speculation could we run into a business model where uh, a real estate broker decides to charge hourly fees can we charge like the attorneys? We we could, except that if I was the broker in, in charge of a whole bunch of licensees, I'm not really sure that I want to keep track of your time. So how feasible it is, I'm not sure. Okay. And then we're going to have to, that conversation is, um we're, we're going to have an additional conversation that it will be necessary, which is an IRS conversation because if you start charging on an hourly basis, maybe the independent contractor status may not work anymore, and you may have to change totally your business parameters as a broker, and I have employees rather than independent contractor, which is not impossible, and we have companies that work on that business model, okay? Again, all business models are okay as long as they are legal, okay? So um, we could have all kinds of different uh, a variety of uh uh, business models that show up, new ones that 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 come. Okay, all right. And I see that a lot of conversations will go over things that will addre be addressed in a, in a little bit. So I'm not ignoring or I'm not um, um, skipping your your comment your your questions there in the Q and A. We are going to uh, address it there just in a in a little bit. Okay. Um, so and NAR, as I will answer one, you know, um, NAR will not give you NAR's job as an association will never be to give you guidance on different compensation model. OK, um, can they get can they give a broker support in helping them decide what works for their business model? Yes. But this is where NAR is kind of an interesting position. They regroup all kinds of different companies all across the country. NAR is not there to say, you know, those are the business models that you can use as a, as a member of our association, not at all, okay? NAR is there to give you the support and the assistance or the, the sort of material and look at different aspects of running businesses different ways, but they will never ever say those are the ways that you should uh, run your business. Every company needs to set up their own business model as they see fit in compare in in light of the services that they will offer. 
So this should, I, you know, so practically speaking, what are some of the things that we should pay attention to? What are some of the things that we need to remember? And what are some of the things that we need to discuss, clarify, make sure that the consumers understand in those, uh, in those relationships, okay. Um, and again, give me give me a second. I'm just looking through that Q and A. All right. Re, re, uh, so the raised hand feature, uh, we're, I'm we're not using it. Okay. So um, if you have questions, they are going into the uh, the Q and A and. Um, I, I know that there's a lot of your questions that I have not addressed and I haven't taken care of yet because hopefully many of them will be um, covered as we continue the, the presentation. Okay. The first thing that I want to highlight and I want to you know sort of stress to everybody, in, to some extent in New Jersey, you're, you're lucky because there is a certain amount of documentation and certain amount of requirements that we already have in our own state regulation that should make your um, life as a real estate licensee easier in light of all the questions that are being brought up by the lawsuit. When I was reading the, um, the deposition from the plaintiff in the Missouri case, since it's the only one, it is, it's the one that went to trial, okay? Some of the comments and some of the things that they said in court, okay, kind of, such as the listing broker came, they came with a filled listing agreement, which had a filled in fee before um, they presented us with the listing agreement would actually be illegal in New Jersey. So the other thing that we all have to keep in mind as we're reading all those different conversations and all those different presentations about the lawsuits that are happening, don't forget that licensing regulation is done at the state level. So what is happening in Missouri, what is happening and what is required in Illinois, okay, will not necessarily be the same in, uh, in New Jersey. And we do have in our regulations a lot of help and a lot of tools that we can use in order to clarify and to make sure that everybody understands what's going on and we're all and and uh, we're you know staying out of trouble with the antitrust rules, but we're also uh, making it clear to the consumer this is how it works, this is how it plays out, this is what you're getting or not getting for that matter. Uh, based on the services that you chose to hire us for, okay? Hopefully everybody remembers the CIS. Hopefully everybody is very comfortable with the CIS. And what I'm going to say, there is one of your state required document that may be beneficial to dust off and spend some time with, okay? What's the um, the we we have an obligation in our new, in our regulations. We have one a document verbiage language that is being created by the state, which is that the text and the content of the CIS. The content of the CIS is basically telling the consumers in New Jersey. Okay, there are four ways you can establish a business relationship with a real estate professional. And I'll come back to this in uh, in in a little bit, okay? But the regulations say it's your job as a real estate licensee to inform the consumer about those business relationship. So whenever I have um, an initial conversation about a real estate transaction, about a potential property, a potential relationship, listing a property, working with a buyer, the first thing I need to do is say, okay. Well, let's first review how we could potentially work together. Here is the copy of the consumer information statement. It's consumer information, right? Educating the consumer. My obligation is to inform them about the four business relationship, give them a copy of the CIS. And then the second part of the re regulatory requirement is 
before they enter into a contract, I have to get an acknowledgement that they received this document before we started the conversation. So what I would propose and what I would suggest is that we don't just hand over CISs to people and, and count on them reading the document. How about we take a little bit more time and go over the content of that document with the consumer? You're doing a listing presentation. Yes, you have to educate the seller on what the business relationships are. You are going to provide a copy of that CIS to the seller before you get started. There is the issue of confidentiality that always comes. They may be inter interviewing different companies. They need to understand that. You want to highlight it. You want to stop. You want to spend the time. You want to explain what is, what is going on. You want to go over the full business relationship, what the differences are to work with a broker this way, that way, or another way, okay? So it's not just handing it over, it's explaining it. It's the beginning of an explanation to the consumer. There are different ways that a broker can work with you. There are different levels of obligations, different different parameters that, can, that you can choose to, um, to agree on or to establish, okay? And then you have the acknowledgement, but I also say there's nothing wrong in getting the acknowledgement way before you actually get a contract. I also gonna remind you that this is also in the code of ethics because standard of practice 1-12 says that we have an obligation to inform the consumer of our company policies regarding cooperation and compensation, okay? So <clears throat> we have to make sure that when we have conversations with the consumer, they understand what is the hat that I'm wearing, what is the role that I am playing, what is my position in that, converse, that particular conversation. This is something that we probably don't spend enough time on because New Jersey allows four business relationships. Seller, buyer's agent, um, and disclosure agent, which are all three agency relationship, which will put the consumer into a client position with a higher level of services. You are hiring me and you are expecting me to provide all those things to you, okay? And they are spelled out in this EIS and maybe it might be worth taking the time to go over the detail of what you get if you, uh, if you choose the client status, if you choose the client level of service. But New Jersey does not require that the consumer becomes a client. New Jersey also allows you to establish a business relationship, which is a transaction broker. As a transaction broker, that consumer will not rise to the level of a client will just remain a customer. I still have some basic obligations to that customer, but nowhere near the same as if the consumer becomes a client. Now, remember, I want my fees to be parallel to my value. There is a different set of values here that you are offering the consumers, which means it would only make sense that the fee should be different if I am going to be working with you as a client or as a customer. Now, here's the other thing that I will say. Remember, you all work under the supervision of your broker, okay? New Jersey, as a state in our regulation, offers four alternatives to work with the consumers. Your broker may choose to only offer a limited number of those. As a real estate company setting up my business, I can say, well, my services are client level services that I want to offer, which means in our office, we are only offering seller's agency, buyer's agency, maybe disclosure agency, but we're not offering transaction brokerage. And then I can have another company that says, no, I have a very different business model and I am going to offer a different types of services to the consumer. I'm not rising to the level of that client level service and I only work as a transaction broker. So the first thing that you all need to know is in your offices, 
what is your broker what is your broker policy what is your broker guidance on what are the business relationships that are acceptable in your companies and i can tell you that out there there's a little bit of everything okay but you all need to know if i work for this company i can offer the client abcd abc d only okay that's that's the you know that's something that you have to be familiar with competitive business every company can set up their own company policies as they see fit every company can choose you know uh, um the selection of those business relationship as part of their company policies okay which then means that that customer or client you need to be very comfortable you know to um in in your understanding if i've established a transaction brokerage relationship that consumer is only a customer and i say only be to make the difference with clients okay but i need to be very clear that since i have been hired to work with a, as a transaction broker and i have a customer this is the limitation of what i can offer to that customer and the acronym that we use to sort of remind ourselves how we work with customers is hard because it's your basic obligation honesty accounting reasonable skills and disclosure i have to be reasonably competent in the real estate transaction in the real estate market i have to make basic disclosures on business relationships and material fact tell you where your money is and remain honest those are basic requirements that you will provide that customer okay but it doesn't go beyond that because if you go beyond that then you're going to step over into the client level services which is the old car acronym obedience loyalty disclosure confidentiality accounting reasonable care and diligence and we cannot afford to go from one category to the other category without having a discussion with the consumer without the consumer being aware of it you do not want to find yourself sort of um creating an an undisclosed relationship working as one when they are expecting you to work as an as another okay so this conversation this understanding for yourself in your in your own business needs to be absolutely clear when i am talking to you you are a client a customer this is what i need to pay attention to this is the hat that i wear this is the script that goes with that relationship okay so there's a lot of you know agency is going to be a big part of what we need to probably brush off on and be a little bit more comfortable as to hey if i'm wearing this hat this is what the conversation is and if i'm wearing this hat this is what the conversation is okay but they're not the same and you need to know how you working but you also need to be able to explain it to the consumers there are different ways we can create that relationship it has consequences you will not have the same level of services in one case compared to the other case okay now how do we go and we create those relationships okay on the seller side it's straightforward because you have a licensing obligation that says you're going to get ultimately a written listing agreement New Jersey does not allow you to list on a verbal agreement at least not for more than 5 days okay so you will always end up with a written listing agreement you have a written contract it's an express contract between the seller and uh the seller and the broker we make it very clear you're hiring me for this task here's the compensation that we are negotiating for this task and we'll come back to the compensation discussion i promise okay but i just want to make i just want to have the initial you know um how do we get there conversation okay. on the buyer side and which is why i was saying earlier we may want to start thinking about creating a more professional um process on the buyer side 
Because on the bio side, there's a little bit of everything that goes. We're at a disadvantage in that the state does not require a written buyer's agreement. The code of ethics does encourage you to always work on written agreements. Okay, so it, it's Article 9. It stops short of telling you it is required, but it says, you know, as, as a realtor, as a professional, I'm really am going to make every attempt at working under a written agreement. Unfortunately, what happens in real life? In real life, well, there is, you sit down, you have a buyer's consultation and you, ne and you negotiate a written buyer's agreement with that buyer, okay? And you spell out the terms of that relationship in the buyer's agreement. Unfortunately, not everybody does, okay? So in some cases, rather than being a, being a written agreement, it might be more of a verbal agreement, a handshake, where it's kind of like, you know, this, yeah, okay, we'll work together. And But the downside of the verbal agreement, besides the fact that you have zero documentation that you have established that, is that you probably did not associate your services with any type of uh, compensation or fee or otherwise, okay? And then, um, you know, some, some of you may just rely on the summary on the purchase and sell, uh, the purchase and sell contract. And then there's a disaster, which is the implied relationship where you're going to walk and talk like a buyer's agent and you've never discussed it. You never agreed with it. Okay. It puts a whole bunch of liability on you and you have zero protection in that scenario. Um, and this is when we end up with undisclosed dual agency and it's a nightmare. So you really, really want to stay away from the implied relationship. What I'm going to try to convince you is that you want to start thinking really long and hard about creating business processes for yourself, which will treat the buyer side of the real estate business the same way as the seller side of the real estate business. Remember what I what when I started all this, I said one of the things that is that is being made clear through all this is that relying on an offer of compensation from a listing broker or seller, I don't care who it is, is not good business practice. Okay. If you want to be in charge of your own destiny when you are working with a buyer, then you really need to set your own specific written relationship with that buyer before you start and you go to work, okay? So um, what I tend to say, and it's my opinion, Okay, but what I tend to say is those of you who have already incorporated the buyer's agreement as a systematic business practices will probably be ahead of the game um, and are on a good path to sort of survive whatever uh, whatever happens in the whatever happens in the in the long run. Okay, so that's the first thing. Okay, think about treating the buyer side of the business, get hired formally in writing from buyers uh, before you set out and you spend in way too much effort in uh, working with those buyers and then find out that, oh, I'm doing all this for nothing. Okay. Now, I don't know when was the last time you read that CIS that I mentioned earlier, but and, and remember, the language of the CIS has been created and established by the state regulation. This is not the language that your broker gave or any state association gave or whatever. It's in our state regulation. It's in our state regulation. But if you read the buyer's agency paragraph, it does finish in bold letter, okay, on the CIS. And it tells the consumer, remember, it's a consumer information statement. It tells the consumer, a buyer wishing to be represented by a buyer's agent is advised to enter into a separate written buyer's agency contract with the brokerage firm, which is to work as their agent. So the CIS makes it very clear to the consumer, you want that level of service that is described into the paragraph of buyer's agency, the best way to make sure 
that you are going to get this is to get it is to establish that relationship in uh, writing. Okay. Now remember, okay, um, the the listing agreement is the contract between the seller and the broker. The buyer's agreement is the contract between the buyer and the broker. Remember all those those two contracts, which I am really putting in parallel to each other. I love the state of Colorado because they call the buyer's agreement a listing agreement for buyers, really emphasizing the fact that we're talking about exactly the same thing, but on the you know on both sides of the of the transaction. Those two contracts, the listing agreement and the buyer's agreement, is the hiring agreement from the consumer of the broker. I am confirming, you know, that yes, I want you to do this job, and yes, you are going to provide those services, and yes, we have negotiated some type of compensation that relates to the services that you will provide. Those are your I, you can call them employment agreement. You can call them, you know, hire you as hire the company as a contractor, whichever way you want. But those are your written agreements that establishes what are the terms of the relationships on the seller side and the buyer side. The purchase and sale agreement. It shows the compensation that will be paid to the, you know, the how compensation will be paid. It's recapped in the purchase and sale agreement. But please keep in mind, the purchase and sale agreement is a contract between the buyer and the seller. You are not, your companies, your brokers are not a direct party of a purchase and sale agreement. We do sort of memorialize in the purchase and sale agreement what the terms of the buyer and the seller's agreement are, Okay, so we memorialize in the purchase and sale agreement. Oh, yeah, by the way, the seller owes the listing broker this and the buyer owes the buyer's broker this. Okay, so it's sort of a confirmation, a recap, a summary, whichever way you want to use it. I am not an attorney. I'm just using those terms to sort of illustrate what it does. Okay, but it does not create a contractual relationship between you and um and the consumer that is done by the listing agreement and the buyer's uh, buyer's agreement. The code of ethics makes it also very clear that you cannot use the purchase and sale agreement to renegotiate your compensation. Okay, so this is the purchase. No one should consider the purchase and sale agreement as an opportunity to establish what my fee is. Okay, my fee was established in those prior contract listing agreement and uh, buyer's, uh, buyer's agreement. Okay. All right. Um, Crystal, I'm, I'm seeing the uh, Q&A lengthen and I, I, uh, I'm, um, I'm going to rely on you to sort of keep track on what, the, what's going, uh, what they're asking and, and uh, sort of see what I have not answered at the, at the end, if that's okay with you. Absolutely. I'll keep you updated. Okay. Thanks. All right. Uh, the dual agency is going to be a mess. I will say this right away. And we may end up, uh, we may start seeing companies that choose not to offer, uh, not to offer dual agency. Okay. So um, there is, we, we will have that conversation at, at some point. Okay. I can also, as a as a company, you know, I, I I'm saying I'm talking about those different contracts. Remember, every company sets their own company policies, um, and I could, as a broker, I could set as an individual company at a brokerage level again. I could have a company policy that says my agents will not start working with a buyer without a buyer's agreement. Okay. And it might make it a little bit easier for the agent to go to the consumer and say, okay, well, you know, this is our company policy. We require this, and this is our process. If you're interested in hiring our services, this is how we work. This is what we require. Now, the, um, because this is a topic that's dear to my heart, I, I am going to, you know, add the following. Please remember, be consistent. 
because the last thing you want is to start entering into fair housing violations. So whatever processes you're putting in place, remember they're applicable to, um, to everyone, okay? I'm not sure, so I discussed the, the CIS, okay? Uh, will there be changes in New Jersey in uh, regulations, in laws, in, in text of the CIS? I can't speak for the Real Estate Commission or the legislature, okay? The CIS has really good information. I'm not sure that that's where the changes will be needed. There are other places where some tweaks may be required, but that's a question for the uh, that's a question for the real estate commission uh, for the real estate commission. Okay, so as a listing agent, and it starts there. Okay, there is your compensation, and hopefully that will address many of your uh, uh, many of your question. Okay, the um, as a listing broker negotiating a listing agreement. Remember, a lot of the things that transpired from the lawsuit is the fact that the sellers felt deceived by how much money they ended up having to pay and what happened to that money. So the transparency on the compensation when you're negotiating the listing agreement can can certainly be improved okay when i do a listing presentation when i negotiate a listing agreement there are a few things i want to make sure that the seller is absolutely aware of it one there is no set compensation everything is negotiable um, we actually have help in new jersey because in our regulation it says that a listing agreement has to have a totally blank spaces for you to then fill in whatever you ended up negotiating with the seller. It's a violation of the licensing regulation to show up with a pre-filled uh, blank space. It's a violation of the regulation to have a blank space that has a percentage sign behind it because that would imply that it can only be a percentage, which is not right. I could list, you know, anything that is negotiable that's acceptable to both parties. Maybe it's a flat fee, okay? Um, maybe it's that hourly rate, although that's probably, uh, you know, a little bit more questionable. But um, the seller needs to know, okay? It's our conversation, it's our discussion, it's our agreement as to what this compensation ultimately will be. There is no such thing as a standard. There's no such thing as a industry-wide requirement. Okay, back to some of the comments that you made earlier. However, I work for this company. As a company, our business practices and our offering, our services are those, okay? Because we offer all those services as a company, our fee in our company is between this and that, okay? That is totally fair when it is done at the company level, not based on what everybody else does, based on the services that you offer as a company. We are a company, we offer those services, because those services have a value, we put a price tag with those services. That's fine at a company level, but overall compensations will always be negotiable, anything of value that works for both sides, okay? It is absolutely imperative that we can all verbalize, express the connection and the relationship between the services we provide and the fee that we charge. We have a tendency as real estate licensees to wanna to make it sound as easy and as painless as possible that real estate transaction, okay? So we're, we're yes, our clients are, and the consumers can get stressed about selling their long-term home or buying this first-time home. And you don't necessarily want to add to the stress level by telling them we're going to need to do this, this, that, and the other thing. And, you know, that list is in infinite or this it seems like it's a never-ending thing. So I have this sort of natural tendency 
as uh, uh, wanting to make it as easy as possible for the consumer. And I'm not necessarily always telling them all the work that I am doing behind the scene. The problem is then they don't see your value. Okay, then they're like, well, wait a second. I didn't, you know, since I'm not realizing you also doing all those stuff behind the scene. Okay, I'm not understanding why you would charge me this much. Okay, so you really have to be clear and, and um, be able in your presentation to the seller to be able to match the services that you offer to the fee that you are charging. Now, and hopefully those two were things that you were already pretty good at and you've been working on, okay? Now you have to add something else to your conversation. You've always had to your conversation, again, because we have a commission split requirement disclosure in New Jersey. So the state was helping us in our regulation, okay? You always have to tell the seller, oh, and by the way, you know, um, we're negotiating an overall amount, okay? But then you need to understand that there is a portion of that that will be offered to a buyer's broker, okay? And you're negotiating that amount with the seller, okay? So you now have to also, and you should always have been able to do so, okay? Be able to explain to the seller what is the benefit of offering compens? What is the benefit to them, not the buyer? What is the benefit to the seller to offer some compensation to a buyer's broker? Okay, um, and you know part of that is tied to the benefit of all the real estate compensation coming out of the proceed of sale the benefit of the transaction paying both real estate commissions rather than having buyers and sellers write separate checks. Okay. So, and I want to make this clear because that, that additional conversation when you're negotiating that listing, there is your, you know, there is the amount and you'll be way better off discussing with the seller. Here are our services. Here's our fee. Now, we also need to talk about the offer of compensation to a buyer's broker. This is the benefit to you as a seller to offer compensation to a buyer's broker, okay? When you're doing this, the benefit to a seller to offer compensation to a buyer's broker, okay, should never be, oh, I got, here we go, should never be, you should never say, that if you're not offering anything, no one will show your property because that means we're boycotting, okay? Or you should never say that the amount that you offer will impact how many agents will decide to show because that means we're selling on commission and both of those are illegal, okay? So if I go back to what's the benefit to a seller to offer compensation to a buyer's broker? Well, to a seller, they will benefit from having a represented buyer. Those are the reasons why they would benefit to have a represented buyer. And the, um, the benefit to the buyer, there, there's a benefit to the buyer for the uh, compensation to be in the transaction because it's then financed. So um, that's how you have to present it. That's, you know, so it's kind of changing, well, or uh, making sure that you're not making statements that are um, antitrust statements, okay? We don't sell to commission, we don't boycott listings, okay? So the conversation with the seller is, there is our fee, and then there's the fee that we potentially offer on the other side, and this is what why it would benefit you to offer that fee to the other side. So you need to work on that conversation. Okay. You will have sellers who say, why should I pay the buyer's broker? Okay. Um, and then, you know, do I have to pay this out if the buyer is not represented? And then what happens if it is your, your office that brings in a buyer? Then I am, you know, then I'm paying too much. I'm not going to tell you what the answers to those questions are, because the answers to those questions can be very company specific. They are going to go back and tie to your business practices, 
to your guidance from your brokerage in your own office. So again, I go back to every company sets their own business policy, okay? So it is possible that uh, a broker will say, well, in this scenario, we'll pay, you know, that, you, that you'll negotiate with the seller different tiered of offering depending on what happens on the other side. Don't remember, don't, re don't forget, sorry, if we are negotiating uh, dual rate or variable rate commission, which means if we have different, um, you know, if we pay this much, if it's an outside company, if we pay this much, if it's an inside sale, uh, then we need to disclose that. So don't forget this little requirement, okay? But you have to be prepared as a listing agent to lead the conversation on those three questions you have to be very familiar with your company policies that relate to those different scenario and what your broker allows and does not allow in those different scenarios. Okay. Um, yes, dual agency is uh, is going to be interesting. Okay, and is there possibilities that some of our licensing regulations change? Maybe this will be the push to bring in designated agency. I have no idea. I'm not a regulator. Okay, so what we what we need to um, we we need to work with what we got at this point. Okay, so we need to think of how we're going to address that as part of our services. How we how we manage the relationship. What are the relationship and the scripts that we allow or not allow in any type of companies? Okay, but. You know, if you're not comfortable answering those questions, you're going to have a problem. Remember, the consumers are seeing all those headlines. They're, while they may not have been thinking about asking those questions in the past, they're way more likely to ask those questions today. Okay. So, um, and, as, you know, some, some of you are making the, the parallel to uh, rental listings. And, and yes, okay, you can, uh, to some extent, depending on what's going on with the rental market, you can make the parallel with the rental, uh, rental listings. I like to make the parallel to the, um, to the uh, commercial world, where for a long time, you know, uh, the broker on both sides have had written agreements with their clients, and it's never been an issue. Each side negotiates their, um, their compensation game. Okay. Uh, some of the uh, some of the uh, additional compensation discussion that you will have to have with the seller. Okay, um, the sellers should be ready that they will receive that they can be receive off they can be receiving offers that include a request for uh, their broker's compensation. A seller has to be prepared when they're reviewing offers that some of those offers may come where the buyer is saying, my offer is $500,000. And out of this $500,000, I wanted you to take out X to compensate what I owe my broker, okay? They need to be ready for that. It shouldn't change anything for the seller. Simply when they review the offer, they're going to take that into consideration. If they are lucky enough to have multiple offers, it will be part of the consideration. It's a fact of the offer. When you review objectively all the different offers, we, it always comes down to the net. Okay, You're going to have to factor in that the net is going to be figured out differently than in other scenario and then compare the offers uh, accordingly. There is also something that is, um, and, and it, hopefully I'm going to be able to make this uh, very clear. None of us should ever sell to compensation, which is why, you know, some MLSs may have allowed in the past that you could sort based on the offer of compensation offered. This, this, has, been, this has been removed, okay? You should never, if I have a buyer client, never should I be sorting possible properties based on how much I'm going to be, how much is being offered, okay? We're moving towards more transparency and compensation, okay? The buyer has hired you. The buyer owes you a certain amount of money, okay? And yes, in that agreement, you will, you know, you will, um, whatever the buyer owes you, uh, you will credit what the seller, what the seller or the listing broker has offered in compensation, 
a buyer, not a buyer's agent, a buyer can make the decision not to see a property because the offer of compensation does not is not sufficient to cover what they owe their broker. Okay. And, but I want to make, I'm, I'm always very leery in bringing this up because I want to make it very, very clear. Never you as a real estate licensee, it would be a buyer's business decision. I agree to pay you X for your services. If this X is not offered by the seller slash listing broker, I do not want to see that property. It is a buyer's decision. You can imagine that in a world of us, when, when we are dealing with the seller's market, this is not about, to, you know, buyers will are highly unlikely to take this position. If we, when the day the market switches and we're in a buyer's market, we may start seeing things like this happening. But I want to make it, I, I don't, I'm hoping that I am very, very clear on this. Never your decision as a buyer's agent. I, I have fiduciary obligation to a buyer client. As a buy, if I have a buyer client and is if I have a buyer client, okay, my obligation is to show them everything that is available on the market that matches their need, no matter what the offer of compensation may or may not be. Okay. Um, so um, be be um be aware of that. Okay. So those, and again, this is a place where we'll, to some extent, we're very lucky in New Jersey because it is part of the mandatory language in the listing agreement. In the regulation, it says that all our listing agreements have to include language that says, as seller, you have the right to individually reach an agreement on any fee commission or other valuable consideration with any broker. No fee commission or other consideration has been fixed by any governmental authority or by any trade association or multiple listing service. That language has, has been in our listing agreement for, for a long time, as long as I've been around, okay, for a long time. Have we taken the time to highlight it to sellers? I'm not always sure. Maybe it might be worthwhile highlighting that language in the listing agreement getting the seller to initial buy it so we can document and say, hey, you know, we made it clear to the seller. There are no standard co compensation. There is no standard fee. It's why you and I agree based on the services that I will provide. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, I will, um, I, I'll... Uh, so now on the bias, sorry, I'm, I'm I'm used to having the questions come up at the same time. So um, on the uh, on the buyer side of the business, okay, elevate your game. Don't work for nothing. Don't run the risk of working for nothing. You cannot and should never, as a buyer's agent, um, depend on the offer of compensation. That offer of compensation can be anything, including nothing, okay? Which means I have, as a buyer's agent, I never have any type of guarantee that the seller will offer anything or that what the seller will offer is sufficient to cover the value of my services. So establish a professional relationship with the buyers. Don't start spending a lot of time and effort with those buyers without having a spelled out uh, understanding in writing as to what you will do and what you expect from them. It's a two-way relationship. I know when I do an agency class, everybody always asking, well, is, are any of those contracts enforceable? They're written contracts. Yes, they can be enforceable. I don't, and, and then you talk to an attorney, okay? Is it, is it likely that you're going to get much out of it? I can't speak to that, okay? None of us want to go to the point of having to enforce a contract. But what I will say is if you sit down, if you go over the terms of a contract and you have a much better, um, you have a, a much lesser risk 
that um, things will go astray or, or, or because everybody is going to have a much better understanding as to what are the parameters, what are the rules of the game. Okay, this is, this is how I work. This is what I do. And in exchange, this is what I expect for you, from you. And again, your, the value of your services should be tied to the fees that you are expecting. I'm, I'm just going to put it out there, okay? And again, the, um, some of the DOJ's questions have come up from, you know, every industry has been disrupted. Why not real estate? It's kind of interesting that the market and, and you know, some of, some of the reasons why we're being questioned in our business practices, okay? The market, you know, a few years ago, the market became a very strong seller's market, but nothing really changed in the compensation model, okay? And I'm really going to ask ye, all of you who work as buyer's agent, in the last three, four years, when you've dealt with multiple offers, where, where you've dealt with, you know, the buyers having to find, you know, three or four properties, put in three or four offers before they saw one offer accepted, okay? Let me ask you this. Did you not work harder then when the buyers could make an offer on the first property that they fell in love with and you were able to negotiate the contract and move on. So as a buyer's agent and having worked that much harder, wouldn't it make sense that my fee should be even higher? Okay, I'm just sort of throwing this, uh, throwing this out for you guys to, to think about it, okay? But your services and your value should be tied and you should be in charge of that. The only way to make sure that you're going to be in charge of that and you're kind of guaranteed that this is going to happen is put it in writing in the contract. Remember what I discussed earlier, having a customer and a client is not the same script. Having a customer or a client is not the same level of service that I will provide to the consumer, which then it would lead to, it is probably not the same that the same compensation or the same type of fee that I am expecting if I am working with a customer versus working with a client. If you're working with a client, you're going to promise that you're going to do everything you can to find them the right house and you're going to look on the MLS and you're going to look for the for sale buy, buy owner and you're going to help them negotiate their offers, beat out other multiple offers. Okay, that's one, you know, that's one list of tasks. And then on the other side, you're working with a customer. You want to get into doors? Fine. I open doors. Here's my fee to open doors. Okay. You, you don't want to establish the, the, the client level relationship? Not a problem. I'm happy to open a door, but there is a fee for me to go out and open a door. Why not? It takes me time. I have to go there. I have to make the appointment. There's a responsibility that I have. Okay. Anything wrong with me charging a fee for opening a door? Check with your broker because, again, it's your company policies, right? So, check with your broker what you're allowed to do and not allowed uh, and not allowed to do. But one could, you know, um, those are things, those are business models that may start popping out. I said a la carte and, and sort of menu uh, driven services. Um, you don't want a long-term relationship. You do not want a, the representation to client level. Well, you know, we can do tasks for, uh, we can do tasks for you. Okay. So you have to get the same way. You have to be very clear on the, on the listing side, how you, how you represent or not a seller. You have to be very clear on the buyer side. Do you have a client? Do you have a customer? What's the script? What are my services? What are the fee that's associated for the services? What does my broker allow or not allow? Because be ready, some of your companies do not allow you to work with customers. You set client level relationship. Other companies only want customers and they don't want clients. So please make sure you know your company policies. And then the same way you have to be ready at answering some of the seller's questions, you're going to have to be ready at answering buyer's questions. And yes, I know you probably want me to give you the answers to all this. I'm not, I'm on purpose, not giving you scripts. Why? Because I want all of you to develop your own script because we're competitive business and because each company can develop their own script. Each company runs their business a separate way. So it's up to you in, your, in the context of your own company to think about how you are answering this and how you're positioning yourself as, as, a, as a company. Okay. 
buyers, you know, I don't need, I don't want a buyer's agent. Okay. Well, you know, again, depending on your company, that's fine. You know, we can offer customer level services and you can uh, hire us for tasks. Okay. But that may not be available for, uh, for everyone. Okay. I never have to sign a buyer's agreement in the past. Well, you know, life changes, the business changes. Okay. You're going to have to uh, explain, you know, what it does, what it, what, what it creates, why now and not before. Okay. Um, and, and all that. I just want to see homes. Again, the answers to this is going to be different depending on your company, your context, your business, uh, your business practices. Okay. But um, I do, you know, if I'm going to run the buyer side of the business as a professional relationship, do I want to be the door opener that then finds out that the buyer goes somewhere else? Probably not, okay? That is not running a very successful business. So you're gonna have to think of how many homes you may decide that you're going to show before they formally hire you or not, for that matter, before they hire you. Again, it's up to you to set those, uh, those parameters. And if they just wanna see homes, maybe they're not ready to buy, okay? Um, I want to talk directly to the listing agent. I recently had a conversation with um, a very successful uh, buyer's agent and, um, you know, she's not afraid of answering that question. Not a problem. You are more than welcome to go talk to the listing agent. Remember in the CIS that puts you in a dual agency, this is, this is what it means. Now, if you're interested in having individual representation, we can talk. Let's set, let's set a meeting at our office so we can discuss what you're looking for, what my services are, and to see if there is a match, okay? But you, you have to be able to verbalize and clarify to the consumer what's the difference between talking directly to a listing agent versus having their own individual representation. Okay. Some of the things that we're going to, uh, that, that, that are, you know, may come up in your um, in your business practices. Um, that's one extreme, you know, uh, we'll have uh, sellers, sellers and listing brokers who will continue to offer compensation that meets a buyer's obligation to their own broker. And then it's kind of, I will say, kind of business as uh, business as usual, okay? But you could also run into a situation where the seller listing broker's offer of compensation is not sufficient to cover the buyer's obligation to their own broker. Now, if I'm a buyer's agent and the offer of compensation doesn't cover all the fee that I negotiated with the buyer, I still, I still have fiduciary obligations to the buyer as we negotiate an offer. The best scenario for the buyer would be for all commission amounts to be included into the purchase price. So the buyer's agreement will, may state that I'm, my first intent will be to make sure that whatever the balance that you owe will be included into the purchase price. But your contract may also make it clear that in the worst case scenario, the buyer may be responsible to paying the difference, okay, out of pocket. We all know what the downside is of paying out of pocket. Buyers don't usually have a ton of extra cash, okay? And yes, it does have to show up on the CD. So then the question is, how do will the lenders uh, cons consider that? And yes, I have a word here on watching dual agency because we do have a really uh, major uh, question in New Jersey. New Jersey makes it illegal to collect dual compensation for dual for in a dual agency position. So in a dual agency position, a broker can only get a check from one party, not two parties, which means that if that last scenario is not possible in dual agency, okay? Not in, uh, not, you, in, not in New Jersey. You may run into a scenario where a seller may say, you know what, I totally understand why I would compensate you. I heard all of your arguments as to why we should offer a buyer's compensation but I'm not interested, okay? It is not up to me as a seller to determine what the buyer's agent's value is. 
and my there, there will be zero offer of compensation. Sellers have the right to do that. Remember, anything is possible on the on the seller side. Okay, that is something that and so now there's a listing that comes on the market and there is you know a zero offer of compensation. One, you are a buyer's agent. You are required to inform the buyer of that property if it meets their needs. You cannot let that stop you from, from informing the buyer of that property. Do you have the right to tell the buyer that that's what's going on uh, on that listing? Absolutely. Can a buyer make the decision they don't want to go? That's their choice, okay? But it's not your, it's not your choice as an agent, okay? Remember my fiduciary obligations to the buyer. It is not for you to have to bring extra money on the day of the closing. So what I will do is help you as much as I can in negotiating an offer that includes your amount, your obligation. So I'll work with you and my negotiation skills will be good. You know, I'm going to use all my negotiation skills to be able to get the seller to accept an offer that includes in the transaction amount your obligation when it comes to my fee. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, and that's how you work in the best interest in the seller. Okay, but the sell the uh, the buyer. I'm sorry. That's how you're going to work in the best interest of the buyer. Okay. Now there's the outside chance that in order to be competitive, whatever the buyer may choose or may have to. Uh, um, pay that compensation uh, se separately and it may not be into the purchase price, okay? And buyers have to be uh, ready for that if that's the term of the buyer's agreement. The big fear that we all have is that buyers will go directly to the listing agent, back to the conversation about dual agency, especially in New Jersey, that where we don't have designated agency. And then the other question is, what are we going to do with the unrepresented buyers? Okay, could we have, technically, could we have buyers that are short of representing themselves rather than a for sale by owner, it's a buy by owner kind of scenario? Absolutely. And then how are we going to deal with this? Because if there was an offer of compensation, does that, you know, there, there, is, there is no agent on the other side. Um, how we're going to deal with this. It's not dual agency. They are not a represented buyer. What does that mean? There's more liability for the brokerage. Um, you know, do they want to be compensated for that liability? You will have to do a lot more work. You'll have to make sure you don't cross the line. And I'm going to say, you better make sure you know what your company policies are on what to deal with that, on how to deal with that unrepresented buyer. If you signed an exclusive uh, right to sell listing, you're not going to run into this. The buyer going directly to the seller because in your listing agreement, it says that if the seller is contacted by anyone, they will um, they will let you know. OK, but if you sign an exclusive agency agreement, that becomes a, that becomes a possibility. OK, and this is where so as many of you pointed out. We do have a, a, a rule and a regulation in New Jersey that says you cannot get dual compensation for dual representation. In other words, the buyer's broker cannot collect a check from the transaction for a portion of the of what is owed to them, and then a check from the buyer for the remaining portion of what is owed to them if you are representing both sides. If you're representing separate sides, if you're seller's agent, buyer's agent, that's not a problem. But if you're representing both sides, if you're a disclosed dual agent, then that's an issue. Um, and is, since you're bringing dual, since we're talking about dual agency, remember that we cannot have dual agency without consent. So don't forget that both the seller and the buyer have to be in agreement that you can wear the dual agency hat. And um, you know, one of one of the scenario could be that some brokerages decide they don't want to be involved with dual agency. I don't know. That may require some changes in the way we set relationships. I I have uh, no idea on that. Okay. Um. The other the other aspect of this is so. Uh, listing agreements and buyer's agreement, we do have standard forms either from the New Jersey Realtor or the MLS, okay? But I please 
you all work for a broker unless you're the broker of record and then you set the you set the company policies so for those of you those of you that are broker of records you you know maybe this may lead you to rethink some of your company policies but if you are a salesperson or broker salesperson working under the supervision of that broker please 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 check what are the forms in your office check what are the forms that you need to use in your office um i would not be surprised that we're starting to see more company specific buyers agreement for example they already exist there are already companies out there that have buyers agreement that are not the same as the one provided by the state association so um and if you think of the idea of uh, we need to set independent um uh, processes so that we are not coming across as colluding in all this, we may see more and more company specific agreements. So please check with your, uh, with your brokers. Okay. The, uh, uh, I, I've talked to multiple lenders and um, they have no clue. Okay. So uh, we, I have no, uh, no definite answer on all this. Okay. Uh, we are very, lenders are very comfortable with um, both sides of the compensation coming out of the uh, purchase price, and they allow this into the uh, the financing. So that is allowed in the financing when it is one amount that is taken out of the, you know, just one lump sum amount that's taken out of the purchase price. Will they allow it if it is at the request of the buyer? Um, how will they consider uh, uh, buyer specific payments? Um, is it or, or if I'm if the buyer is asking the seller to take out of the proceeded sale, is that going to be considered a concession? Will that uh, will that affect the you know there's a cap on closing cost? Uh, will that go into the closing cost cap or not? Um, all, those are all questions that the lenders will have to answer, and we don't have uh, we don't have I don't have any particular guidance. Um, NAR is warning us, and it is part of their talking point. Um, NAR is is you know bringing up the, the uh, a few issues. Um, if you're starting to put the burden on the buyers to pay separately compensation that cannot be taken out of the purchase price. Uh, you are putting at a disadvantage your lower end of buyers and your first time home buyers because they are the ones that are the least likely to have the additional cash to pay for the compensation. And then you have the issue of FHA and VA buyers. The VA buyers are not allowed. Um, it's in the, reg of, uh, in the regulation of the VA loans. They're not allowed to pay a buyer's uh, agent brokerage compensation. It has to be in the, in the total price. Um, there are limitations on um, closing costs in the FHA and FHA loans. Uh, so depending on how the buyer's compensation gets addressed, that's going to be a potential issue. So, um, you know, that we need to see um, what type of uh, possible changes are being done by those uh, those other uh, those other agencies. OK. Um, I'm, I'm randomly looking at stuff. This this uh, this whole you know, I know, I know I sound like I'm lecturing and I'm, I'm like, but this whole idea of, of strengthening your buyer's business, uh, some of you are already, some of you already have processes. Some of you are already working with buyer's agreement and you're well on your way of being prepared for all of, for everyone else. If you're not, uh, the time to implement that is now. Okay, <laughs> you do not want to. You do not want to wait. I, I guess um, otherwise you're just gonna wait until uh, one day you're gonna work for nothing, and then you're gonna be like, "Ooh, um, yeah, I need to revise my my uh, process. I need to sort of take charge of my own destiny." So there is, we have everything in place. We have all the tools in place. We have all the guidance in place in order to have a very strong buyer's business. It only is a comment upon us to put it in motion. Okay, so it's only, you know, nobody uses a buyer's agreement. That is so untrue. Um, there are plenty of um, real estate professionals out there who have made that part of their business practices a, a long time ago. Okay, so it's it's uh, it's not that nobody does. Okay, it's there. It exists. It's available. 
uh, use it. Okay. So again, going forward, and this is what I'm going to uh, leave you with, and then I'll uh, see with Crystal uh, what else I, I need to uh, address. Okay. But transparency is on compensation. We need to you know spend more time explaining to the consumer what are the services we provide and what are the fees that we're charging and how this all works okay everybody needs to understand that fees are always negotiable okay um treat your business in a professional manner work on written agreements as is encouraged by the code of uh, ethics and please, 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 all, you need to be able to express, articulate the services for the fees. They need to match. If I am paying this much, what am I getting in return? If I'm only paying this little, what am I getting in return? Okay. You absolutely, absolutely have to be able to connect the services and the compensation, okay? Because if there is no relationship between the two, then it doesn't make any sense, okay? There are plenty of resources that are out there. NAR does have a, a, a dedicated uh, webpage where they keep updating what's going on and how things evolve, and they have been doing that for a while. It's called competition.realtor. So if you want any update on what's going on, and we should be seeing the judges... Um, uh, uh, final verdict coming up pretty soon. So I would watch this, okay? Um, if you want to learn about creating a, 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 a higher standard buyer's business, seller's business, you have two designations, uh, the ABR on the buyer side, the SRS on the seller side. And then it all comes down to um, what's the script? What's my position? What's my role? What can I say? Um, do I have a customer? Do I have a client? How do I treat a customer versus a client? And that is addressed in many of your um, agency CE uh, courses. And then I left you with um, the gen uh, uh, an email if you have further questions, a general email for the for the association. All right, Crystal, what else do I, uh, what did I um so I, I uh, Isabel, I put a couple of questions into my private chat with you if you want to review them. Oh, um, oh, okay. I, yeah, okay. Hold on. Let me, uh, so give me a second, guys, so I can uh, read this, okay? So usually if the, um, if a buyer, it, t um, typically, if in a buyer's agreement, and again, think of it, it, it's going to make the most sense for if I work in the best interest of the buyer, you negotiate with the buyer an overall compensation and you, and you will tell the buyer if there's anything offered by the seller listing broker, then I will credit that towards the compensation that you're offering me. So there's not going to be a sort of a, a, a discount for the uh, listing broker side and on the, the listing broker and the seller have agreed on an overall compensation. The seller is comfortable. The seller has said, you know, I understand the benefit to me of offering X to a buyer's broker. And on the buyer's agreement side, there is a negotiation that says, okay, the value for to work with you as my agent or to hire you as my agent, as my representative, as my advocate is this. And um, if for some reason there is compensation from the seller listing, this will be credited, okay? And then I may or may not have to pay the, the balance, okay? So usually that, that is the, the, the most likely scenario that is in the best interest of both uh, sides, okay? So, and, and I hopefully made it very clear, the dual agency and compensation can get tricky because New Jersey rules specifically say no dual compensation for dual representation, which means if you are a disclosed dual agent, the, the entire compensation needs to come out of the preceded sale from one side, okay? And not both, uh, both sides, okay? 
I'm not going to go into the uh, legal discussion as to when our compensations do when payable. I will leave that to your attorneys and company uh, and companies interpretation. I'm not an attorney. That's a legal question. I'm going to leave that uh, alone. Okay. The and I I'm more focused on the sales than I am on the rentals. Um, the the rental market is very different than the sales market. If you're going to be representing a tenant and you're going to charge the tenant in fee, then please come follow your company policies. There should be really a disclosure on what are the fees that you're charging and when. Okay. Uh, so I, that's something that, again, I'm not really focusing on. It's not really the topic of the uh, lawsuits at, at this point. Okay. As far as creating, uh, uh, so uh, there is a lot of information. So Q and A, there is a lot of information uh, that is on the competition.realtor website and on the NAR site. Okay. Uh, remember that there'll be general answers because remember that as an association, we cannot direct members of the associations to behave one way or another way, right? Because every company sets their own business practices. So the limitations that you have uh, from the resource of a state or local association is that none of the Q&A will be able to address specific business practices because we're not setting business practices as an association okay um it, uh, procuring costs is a whole other conversation that we can spend hours on if i am being hired to just open doors is that will will that make me procuring costs no, probably not, okay? But you end up with an unrepresented buyer. Could it be used because you opened the door and then the buyer decided that um, they wanted you to follow up? The buyer decided that they were going to hire you now to write an offer on that property. Um, who knows how the relationship will evolve from there? So it may or may not be uh, be part, part, well, it always will be part of your procuring cause defense, but will you will it guarantee you to be procuring cause? No, nothing ever guarantees you to be procuring cause, okay? Um, yes, and I'm not speaking on behalf of anybody, okay? Anything that I say, it's either reference, uh, it's either reference to regulations that we have or, or uh, articles that are in the code of ethics, okay? And the rest is my, uh, the rest is my opinion. I'm not an attorney. I'm not representing uh, NCJR or NAR or any of your companies. Um, it's, it's sort of a compilation of our regulations, our rules, what is happening, and then um, my opinions, 